Hola, ¿qué tal, Ana? Hola, Manuel, ¿cómo estás? ¿Cómo estás? Bueno, bienvenidos a todos. Hoy vamos a tener la tercera edición de Archivo Redux, como venimos teniendo los dos viernes pasados, eh, junto a Ana Font, coordinadora del Archivo de Arquitectura. Y vamos a seguir teniendo, teniéndola los viernes que siguen, también a las 7 de la tarde. Eh, bueno, hoy vamos a ver eh, la conferencia de Neil Leach del 25 de abril de 2017, Swarm Intelligence. Sí, ¿No? Se, seguimos en 2017, ¿no? Hemos visto, todas las que hemos visto son de 2017. Eh, claro. Más adelante iremos más atrás en el tiempo, pero ese año fue muy prolífico. Viste claro. buenas visitas. Sí, estaba pensando eh, algo de, interesante de, de, de Neil Leach, eh, la idea de, de, de la idea de Swan o la idea de enjambre. Eh, casi que uno lo podría ver, además del contenido, que es, que es lo que va a presentar, uno podría hacer como una lectura eh, meta o transversal eh, y leer el la forma en que, en que lo presento, la forma que está pensando, o la práctica misma eh, de Neil eh, como una práctica swarm, ¿no? como una práctica de enjambre. Eh. Sí, sí, sí es, es cierto. O sea, en, en la conferencia tiene como una setea una cantidad de reglas simples que después construyen una com complejidad mayor, ¿no? me parece, a medida que avanza y... Y lo hace a través de agentes, eh, literalmente. O sea, hay mucha construcción de linajes ¿no? culturales. Claro, sí. sí. Este, pareciera que todos esos nombres que uno, que uno va a ver en la conferencia, eh, casi que... No, no sabría decir si es un rasgo particular de Neil, pero sí un rasgo de esta conferencia. Eh, uno lo podría pensar como que está eh, armando formaciones, ¿no? o grupos, o pequeños grupos. Eh, y pensando, como si fuese que está pensando enjambradamente, casi. Eh, sí. Y, sí, eh. sí, incluso eh, me parece que hay, hay algo interesante en cómo, eh, digamos, fluye la, la conversación, que también tiene que ver con, con ese statement que está haciendo respecto de una... Eh, de un, un posicionamiento de, en la arquitectura que es más dinámico que estático, de la idea de emergente, eh, justamente, ¿no? De sistema de, de, de emergentes cualitativos y de ahí empieza a generar como líneas que van de Deleuze a Delanda y a esta idea de, de dinamismo que después se vinculan con eh, prácticas particulares de las cuales va a mostrar vídeos durante su propia conferencia de personas hablando sobre temas. Entonces, como que toma, a, 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 termina como construyendo una especie de profundidad de varias capas que se suceden y no son todas eh, puramente sobre un mismo plano, sino que van oscilando también en los registros que, que contienen. ¿no? Claro, sí, está buenísimo, como el, un pensamiento que tiene tres dimensiones, por lo menos, o quizás claro. más. Eh, eh, no, pero y en, en eso que decías, también podríamos avanzar quizás algo de como el pensamiento en hambre, eh, en el sentido de que es un teórico, si es que lo es, es un teórico que pasa a la práctica o, o, o no hace falta, si bien él lo, él lo, lo hace, hay momentos donde, donde dice, bueno, y entonces hicimos tal cosa y hay como una práctica, también me parece que en lo que decías hay una forma de pensar la teoría como una teoría que conecta con prácticas eh, y no, como me parece que, que lo va a decir solalladamente o explícitamente por momentos, como sus enemigos, uh -huh. que son los que, que piensan a la teoría como eh, sí. una interpretación de fenómenos eh, lejanos, eh, no, y no, eh, no, no dentro del, del barro. Eh, bueno, el barro ya es como otro universo igual, pero sí. Sí, eh, sí. Sí, creo que la, la, la idea de la computación es la que hace que eso sea todavía más visceral, en, en su caso. ¿no? O sea, tiene mucho grano fino en el hecho de que la computación lo que hace es no, no eh, como escapar a lo representacional, a lo estilístico como problema y funcionar eh, en, en una cantidad de, de protocolos que él, hay un momento que dice la, esta especie de, de clash entre lo algorítmico y lo paramétrico, o sea, incluso dentro de lo computacional también posiciona y abre aguas y dice 
no solamente dice no estilístico, sino que dice no paramétrico, sino algorítmico, y dentro de eso, ¿no? Y va definiendo esos, esos pasos. Claro. Eh, sí. sí. Sí, bueno, sí. como dentro de grupos también es eso, ¿no? Como de, sí, con, de... con la computación como, como hilo, sí. cuando, lo digo por lo que decías de la práctica, ¿no? Porque me parece que el, la, la idea de la práctica, o como él se define a sí mismo, él es un, como un crítico teórico, pero también se define a sí mismo como una persona que está usando la computación. Entonces, al, al, al definirse también eh, agente él mismo creo que puede construir eh, esta, esta, este atravesar eh, teorías mediante la práctica y viceversa que tú estabas eh, como leyendo out ahora, ¿no? Que... Claro. Sí, o sea, en, en eso me parece que se abre como una incógnita que puede ser interesante pensar la conferencia así, ahora que la veamos, eh, que es cuán computacionalmente está pensando como crítico, ¿no? Uh -huh. O sea, como un crítico que no piensa sobre la computación, sino que piensa eh, ya computacionalmente. O sea, ya, está, ya está embebido de, de, del medio que quiere, sobre el cual quiere pensar. ¿no? Es sí. Interesante. sí, eso es interesante. A lo mejor en ese sentido, como estamos in, como queriendo singularizar un poco las charlas o encontrarle el, eh, ese punto que la, la semana pasada también hacíamos, eh, a mí me, me parece interesante el hecho de que la, la conferencia empieza... Eh, Hablando del primer libro que, que, hizo, que, digamos, que publicó, que es una, es una traducción del de Tratado de Alberti, eh, que hizo con varios, pero principalmente con Joseph Rickberg, eh, y, y termina también hablando de cómo eh, Alberti y Brunelleschi, y dice particularmente Brunelleschi, estarían fascinados con, la, con las tecnologías de la computación. ¿no? Eh, entonces me parece que, que eso acaba como de cerrar el círculo de... de ¿no? De, 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 de la singularidad sí. de, la, de su posicionamiento. Claro, claro, sí, sí, sí. O, 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 claro, es el momento en el cual empieza a, a pensar con fuerzas precedentes también, ¿no? O sea, las empieza a, a incluir. Eh, es, es interesante eso. Eh, como no es algo ya del, del pasado, sino que lo piensa como en términos de, de, de presente. Está bueno. Sí, está buenísimo. Claro, sí, me parece que eso es, es una cosa muy interesante y que, y que es una manera de pensar transhistóricamente que, que es muy potente y, y muy contemporánea. Eh, claro. No sé, si te parece, veamos Dale, ahí, que nada. No. Buenísimo. Claro. Y solo recordarles a quienes están viendo que el, al término de esta conferencia vamos a habilitar la anterior del viernes anterior y así sucesivamente eh, hasta que eso, en algún momento tendremos que habilitar una sin presentar, pero eso es un problema numérico. Pero, bueno, <risa> bueno, bueno, perfecto. bueno. vemos, vemos la, la conferencia entonces. Nos vemos luego. Chao, Adiós. gracias. A ver, me parece que teníamos un error. Vamos a, a empezar de nuevo. Creo que ahí estamos, con sonido. Hasta luego. Buenas, buenas noches. Um, I'm going to do this in English uh, because the lecture is going to be in English and also uh, for him to understand what we're saying. Um, uh, 
As you may know, my name is Santiago Miret. I'm coordinator of the Center of Studies of Arquitectura Contemporánea. Uh, as you also may know, uh, the center coordinates and organizes all our, uh, extracurricular activities uh, that take place in the school in order to generate disciplinary and cultural uh, debates that hopefully transcend us as uh, individuals and contribute to the general disciplinary corpus of architecture. And uh, with tonight's event, this is uh, not an exception. I want to thank all for being here in such a terrible night and uh, especially our guest, uh, Professor Neil Leach. Um, this is a special evening in many ways. One of them is that uh, we're inaugurating the new Aula Magna, this, this uh, same room, uh, designed by Ciro Nacle and Anna Font, also present here. Um, I mention this because I want to welcome all of you on behalf of Ciro and Anna, and because this, it is a privilege that uh, very few schools can have to be able to uh, effectively experience architecture in this way, so uh, you're welcome. Uh, this event that is part of a series of activities developed in collaboration with uh, the Maestría en Historia y Cultura de la Arquitectura de la Ciudad, directed by Julian Baras. And um, the intention of these activities is to accelerate the interests of the master program and at the same time to place uh, to generate a place for discussion of uh, relevant disciplinary topics uh, and um, Julian can be more precise about this but I can say that the general goal may be to expand the idea of history to a broader propositional active and positive approach to produce a distance from traditional archivist points of view of the discipline. In this sense, I believe Professor Leach is one uh, representative of moving forward this uh, process. So, uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I want to thank you all again for being here, and I'm going to leave you with Julian, that will present uh, Neil Leach properly and moderate the event. Thank you. Hola, buenas noches. Bueno, muchas gracias por, por acompañarnos. Eh, un placer de estar en el y darle la bienvenida a la Escuela de Arquitectura de Estudios Urbanos de la Universidad entera. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you for your flight and your trip to the uh, Talk to us. Uh, I want to start the introduction by uh, saying that although some of us uh, have been acquainted with uh, Neil for a number of years, uh, in my case, since uh, 2001. Uh, it is not uh, those personal reasons that prompted us to invite him here <coughs> to lecture. Um, um, Neil Leach belongs to a group of architects uh, and thinkers, amongst which one could count people such as Manuel de Landa, Mario Carpo, and perhaps even someone like Charles Jenks, but also here in the school, people like uh, Luis Ortega, who is teaching in the studio. <coughs> Uh, who have dedicated uh, their effort to theorizing what has been called the digital revolution in architecture. Since at least the publication of E Futures, uh, Neil Leach has been scrutinizing the developments that have been taking place at the technological forefront uh, of the discipline. Uh, this has included the renewal of the philosophical basis of our relationship with technology and certainly an indictment of the Heideggerian preconceptions on which much of the theory of architecture and phenomenology still relies today. While digital theory is not the only field of work, um, it, is a focus, uh, or it is this focus on the impact of digitalization that we want to bring today out for us today. Um, if digital revolution, as early signs uh, need to look for back in the 1950s, um, it acquired momentum in the 1980s when personal computing became a physical reality. During the 1990s, uh, the design professions were taken by storm when the computer power of personal devices crossed the critical threshold that allowed architects not only to be more efficient and more democratic, but fundamentally to explore and map out previously unknown design possibilities. Since then, the phenomenon of digital technology appears to have been nothing less than an ongoing revolution and as such needs to be revised and rethought regularly to understand where it is heading and what values it is constructing. These are the main uh, motivations behind our education. 
uh, Neil Leach is an architect, curator, and writer. Um, he's currently teaching at Florida International University at the Graduate uh, uh, a European Graduate School in Switzerland and Tongji University in China. He has also taught at Harvard GSD at the University of Southern California at SIAR, the Architectural Association, Columbia, Cornell, at the South Institute of Architecture, Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, University of Nottingham, University of Bath, and University of Brighton. His research interests fall broadly into two fields, critical theory and, design, and digital design. In the field of critical theory, he has published a number of monographs and edited volumes, dealing largely with the impact of important theoretical tools of critical theory into the architectural arena. This includes the Thinking Architecture, 1997, the Anesthetics of Architecture, 1999, Millennium Culture, 1999, um, Architectural Revolution, also 1999, The Hieroglyphics of Space, 2002, China, 2004, and Camouflage, 2006. In the field of digital design, he has published a number of edited volumes, including Designing for a Digital World, Digital Tectonics, Digital Cities, and Swarm Intelligence, Architectures of Multi-Agent Systems, Tongji, 2017. He has also worked on two research projects for NASA, to develop 3D printing, a 3D printing robot for Moon and Mars. Please let us do a warm welcome to the image. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for laying on the weather. I feel very much at home. Um, so, I guess in some ways this does have a historical perspective, this whole lecture, um, partly because in a very contemporary way, uh, this book, um, Summer Dungeons, came out about two weeks ago. Um, Roland Swift, my co-editor, gave a lecture in Miami. Um, we think that we can launch the book. Um, but it's historical also because, it, I mean, in part because they were going to connect with some of the debates that were going on at the AA when I was working with Cyril. It's great to see Cyril again. Um, uh, uh, after the AA, I was at Cornell and then GSD, and we did quite a lot of places. But, um, but I want to go back actually even further. Um, what prompted this in some ways, uh, my concern? For the digital. It was partly from my own experiences, but at a very early age, my first publication was a translation of Alberti's Books on Architecture, they already had at Victoria, from Latin into English. And um, that came out in 1988. What I was doing that was the first thing I did that would be on the computer. But I began to realize that the advantages of computation was that, in terms of that kind of thing, was that you were able to kind of like revise and revise and revise and revise the text in a certain kind of way. Um, uh, in the, before that, it was the days of typewriters and tippets and things, and you couldn't afford to do it more than twice. But I remember the conversation with Joseph Rickler, to with whom I did the translation, and he said, well, what kind of style are we going to use? Postmodernism. And what became very clear to me was actually out of the process, out of the process of continuing to be able to revise the text, something began to appear. Um, uh, out of way, a, a very precise, very, I think, very terse style of, 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 of language. At the same time, uh, at the University of Cambridge, uh, I was taught by, being taught by people like Aldo Racy, who were Hadigarians, and uh, they, they forbade us to use the, the computer in, in, the, in the studio. Um, so maybe I had this kind of beautiful kind of murder the father impulse in me, but um, uh, first of all, I, I, I produced a book called Forget Heidegger. Um, uh, and secondly, I thought, well, there must be something here that needs to be pushed, so it kind of came out of that. Um, so, I would, uh, at the same time, you know, I, when I'm trying to theorize it, which is not at all easy, um, uh, it's extremely difficult. And I want to actually distance myself from certain people who see it uh, in terms of styles, um, of representational logics. Uh, uh, Patrick Schumacher, whom I admire in many ways, I completely disagree with. Um, and also Mario Carpo, frankly, I find him a historian who sees things in terms of style. And, um, I don't think he's going to work with the digital. So, um, and it's, it's not at all easy. And I, I'm beginning to realize that it's, uh, in many ways, the same problems are happening in 
understand the using tools that are there with the analog world. But uh, it's an ongoing project. And I want to then pick up on one aspect of it, which uh, the most recent one in terms of publications, but in some ways also the most long-standing one we've been working for years, the question of from intelligence and how that can be seen as a manifestation of um, the kind of theoretical approach towards uh, digital computation. Um, in the background, I mean, if I criticize people like Mario Park because they're historians who see the world in terms of style, I also have to kind of like uh, declare that I see this world through a certain lens, um, uh, through what we call critical uh, theory in England, um, Americans call preparedness. Um, and then Deleuze, I think, is somebody that has been a real influence on me. Um, but in part because of my, when I was working and teaching in Columbia, I came across the book of Amon Lander, and he was always promoting Deleuze. Um, and certainly for me, one of the most important books um, <coughs> is his collaboration with Felix Bukhari, A Thousand Plateau. Uh, I would say Deleuze has been misunderstood by a lot of architects, um, especially Brazilian. Um, uh, because it sounds like he's talking about architecture, he talks about folds and things, he talks about diagrams, but he's not talking about architectural folds, he's not talking about architectural diagrams, he's talking about ways of thinking. His one reference to architecture in, um, in a, a Thousand Plateau is in sort of under the section on the wall machine where he talks about, two, he uses two architectural examples to uh, illustrate two different ways of thinking. Um, one way of thinking is we, we, we call it the Romanesque, but I guess you call it the, the classical, which is a kind of a logic based on representation, on templates, on following rule books, um, uh, major sciences, and so on, uh, which is not about structure or process, but representation. The other one is the Gothic, not just the historical Gothic, but the notion of the Gothic as a way of thinking. It's about processes, about performance, about um, uh, uh, about especially structural questions, and that, to my mind, seems to be kind of an important way of thinking. They kind of, they, they, in a very delusional way, they enter into a, 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 a case of a simple presupposition, they fold into one another, but I think it's important to kind of celebrate this alternative way of thinking, uh, which I think Sarah's work also kind of locks into uh, the, the kind of Gaudi, Fry Otto tradition that we see more recently, as being a way of becoming the kind of the emphasis on representation of postmodernism. So I sort of see it, what I would call new materialism, the work of Mamma Delander has been a kind of way of, um, of overcoming that. It's, it's not that we, we can do without representation, but we need to kind of shift the emphasis. So this is the guy I think I would say has been the most influential of all, Mamma Delander, uh, Mexican American um, uh, street philosopher, um, and especially I think his book. Uh, Thousand years in American history, so I like it the most of all, where he begins to sort of look at the kind of question of urban growth, urban formation um, of history itself outside of the representation of discourse and focusing on processes. On um, uh, uh, one of the sections is called Marvels and Magnus, and to understand how uh, we need to engage with the world in kind of process. Um, so, um, and alongside that, I think there's another kind of agenda that comes in, which is to say, um, if you see the world in terms of, um, of, of, of processes, you can see it in terms of morphogenesis, in terms of form finding, which diverse contrasts to the hylomorphic world, which you impose things, form on the world. It's quite different between form and formation. Formation where it's the bottom up process and imposing form in the top down way. Um, and of course, so um, the, the simple bubble is, is sort of an example of how. <coughs> It's how material computation of work in nature, and the bubble finds its form, the sphere, as a result of the kind of computation of the, between the internal and external pressure, the surface tension, and so on and so on. Um, and that has influenced a number of kind of thinkers that I, or the architects that I, I think are important, Gaudi, uh, um, and Flato, and so on. Um, and in some ways, you can sort of see that in uh, a contemporary world, there is kind of shift towards a kind of biological kind of way of thinking, um, inspired by and natural systems, um, but not just for the sake of that. It's not about biomorphology, about copying the forms of nature. It's about trying to understand how things happen in nature and redeploying those kind of processes within an architectural arena. Uh, and also to kind of shift away from a kind of rather sort of static world um, towards a kind of world of dynamic kind of systems um, uh, that reconfigures things. I, mean, I think it's something that's going to extend throughout all the sciences and all the arts. So that you've got to shift from kind of a technology towards biotechnology, from kind of uh, chemistry towards biochemistry, 
uh, in philosophy from, from towards a kind of biophilosophy, and Deleuze was referred to as a biophilosopher by Pete Pansford Pearson. And of course, I guess it's a bioarchitecture, which is not to say necessarily um, uh, thinking in forms of nature, but rather understanding and learning from kind of natural systems. And, and a lot of this kind of this, these kind of ideas were that uh, um, while I was at the AA, would be kind of followed by a number of people. Um, uh, uh, biomimicry, biome biometicism, the idea that how Velcro came, came about, where you understand certain things, and, or indeed the way that certain swimwear learned from the kind of ways that uh, sharks the skin operated, through to the kind of the um, Eden project that was inspired by natural systems, and so on and so on. Um, so uh, this was kind of, I guess, a, kind of a background concern that fed into the work, especially at Packing Mangas um, um, and Neri Oxman, who in a kind of weird way were both students together at the AA. Um, I think they're, they're two of the ten most significant people around right now. Um, and Mary is part of an AD, which I'm doing at the moment on three things of what about, I, I call body architecture, so the body style um, uh, work. Um, but both of those people are informed very much by their um, uh, by kind of biological kind of metaphor. So the, the, the term swarm intelligence, um, it, I want to sort of get a, there's a sort of trajectory in a way that goes from the first book, which was um, produced by three European scientists, um, Ed Bonobo, Mark Dorigo, and Peter Alice, who were working at the Santa Institute. Uh, and they produced this book, Swarm the Capitalist, in 1999, which is incredibly interesting, but very kind of turgid in a way, because it's written by, it's, it's written by scientists, in, 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 intelligently written, but difficult to, to, to digest. Uh, I think the, the, the very day of 9-11, Stephen Johnson produced Emergence, which is a kind of repackaging. Um, of this same kind of discourse that uh, emerges the connected lives of hands, brains, cities, and software. This will be something I want to pick up in a moment. Um, um, which, although he's not a scientist, a popular science writer, he managed to kind of massage this into a very accessible, um, best selling book. And then um, on the right, this book we, we produced um, this year, um, Storm Intelligence Architectures and Multi Human Systems. Um, so, what do we mean by um, storm intelligence? Um, well, uh, this is a, one of the places I used to work at was the University of Brighton. And uh, you can see here flocks of starlings in Brighton, um, especially in winter. And they come into roost in the evening and they perform this very beautiful um, kind of aerial gymnastics, um, uh, exquisite display. Um, I, I, in the States, they don't get the same kind of uh, manifestation, but, but certainly in Europe, in Rome, and other places, you can see um, remarkable uh, examples of this. Um, um, I'm just realizing I need to get the sound on here. Um, is there a sound? Sorry, I'm plugging the sound in. Um, well, maybe, oh, no, I can use it on my head. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, um, let me just um, show you a video of. Um, of what we are talking about here. This is uh, in, in um, the north of England, uh, some starlings roosting. The, the logic of storm intelligence is to say that um, uh, the point is there's not a single bird that is leading this um, flock of birds. Um, it's, what's happening is each individual agent, each individual bird, is following a set of very simple and basic rules. And what's interesting is how complexity emerges out of simple rules, just in the case of Cirrotometer. Um, it's like very basic, and, 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 and then something appears where the whole becomes greater than the sum of the parts in some way. It takes on a certain sort of life of its own. Um, uh, so, um, the, and the birds themselves uh, are not aware of exactly what the, the, of the formation that they're making. Um, so what they mentioned is basically there's a bottom-up collective process whereby uh, these birds begin to sort of um, produce this uh, um, astonishing displays. So maybe I'll, I'll just um, play the, the sound and see. Okay. Spectacle has spread across three counties the small flocks of 15 to 20 starlings that spent their days foraging the fields, farmyards, gardens, and rubbish dumps within a 25 mile radius of Ottomar. As the afternoon light starts to fade, the starlings quit feeding and take to the air and gather in large flocks of up to a thousand before joining the two or three aerial corridors that snake across the countryside, avoiding the hills and pylons and create troublesome turbulence for these long-distance daily commuters. Invisible, perfect avian motorways made visible by the bodies of the birds. The eager individuals lead the way towards the roost, the vanguard of thousands yet to follow. 
Early arrivals in trees around the chosen roosting area, waiting for the nests to come. As the perch is filled with birds, the press of bodies forces them to join with the overhead aerobatics. They start out flying in the groups they've been feeding with all day and slowly merge into bigger and ever denser flocks. I spent hours watching and never seen a collision. How can that be possible? Individuals were moving in a single entity. And the reason for this behaviour? Well, the house of eyes looking for predators on the roost site. Nothing could escape their gaze. No raptor could surprise this soaring mass of bird flesh. The activity warns their bodies for the cold night ahead. And there's something social going on here because when they do settle to roost, the warmest and safest perches in the reeds will be taken by the dominant males. Adolescents and females will be pushed to the edges. So the birds are also moving to position, social position. Um, what is interesting about this phenomenon is it, it, it happens, it's man, the same behavior is manifested with whatever the agent. So it could be a school of fish, it could be a swarm of bees, it could be indeed human beings. Um, there is a kind of uh, a bottom up process that whereby uh, this kind of formation is an operation. Well, what is the relevance for this for architecture? I mean, it's, it's kind of beautiful in some sort of way. Um, but how can we kind of make connections? Well, first of all, it, it, it should be fairly clear from the title of the of book Emergence, Connected Lives of Ants, Brains, Cities, and Softwares, that you know, if you can see that um, uh, if each of them is seen as, as um, if you're talking about neural networks in terms of computation, that you can begin to kind of make connections between computation, cities, and these, um, these sort of phenomena that automatically uh, suggest something. Um, but let me just... Uh, <clears throat> Um, sorry. Uh, so one of the, the early starting points um, in trying to understand this behavior was a, um, a guy called Craig Reynolds who produced um, these things called voids, where he was trying to map and understand the behavior, flocky behavior of birds. What I find interesting about this is that it was because he, in order to understand that, he had to understand the rules. And in understanding the rules, he actually was able to inform the biologists who up until then hadn't fully understood the way that birds would flock. So, in some sense, this becomes a kind of like a metaphor for what I hope that the world of digital will, will do for us. In other words, that maybe we will understand things about the analog world coming out of the, of the digital domain. Um, so, 
I guess you can sort of see examples uh, throughout architectural history of um, uh, a kind of swarm-like behavior, the way in which these, these um, buildings um, on a, an island in, in Greece um, cluster together. They're kind of following the contours of the land and they're, they're kind of relating to their neighbors uh, in a very similar way to, to how the, the, um, the flocking behaviors of birds happen. And one can see um, many examples of this, this is in Marrakesh, um, of how this sort of happens in terms of vernacular architecture, more so than in terms of contemporary architecture. I mean, you know, you look at building by Zaha, the idea is it stands out and doesn't relate so much to its neighbors. But in terms of vernacular architecture, you can see many examples of how this is happening. But it also strikes me that kind of in some sense it becomes a kind of a, a way of understanding how the logic of emergence, how things emerge by kind of incremental uh, differentiations is a way actually with architecture itself evolved. If you think about the kind of way we transition from the, the classical to uh, the Romanesque to the Renaissance to the Mannerist to the Baroque to the Neoclassical and so on, it is kind of like it's a mutation within a kind of system where there is a slight change um, emerging from that. Equally, when we think about certain typologies, like a Swiss chalet, for example, which also emerges over time um, through material considerations, the length of the timber that you've got, the kind of the, the angle of the roof to keep the snow on to keep the insulation, and presumably also internal circulation kind of questions like the space required for a, a family to have a fondue on a Sunday night or something. All these things can kind of come together in a way and, and um, one can begin to sort of see that this logic of emergence is, not, is, is something that has already, always already been there, even though it's a relatively uh, recent um, theory. So the Hutong in China, um, the favelas in, in Latin America, and so on, all kind of follow this particular kind of logic. What I also find interesting about this uh, logic is, is that the, uh, Kevin Kelly, um, who uh, um, was the editor of, of Wired magazine for a while, took some of these principles and applied them to how the economy operates. Um, and it's kind of interesting to think about it in that kind of way. The economy is out of control. Um, it's a very bottom-up thing. And let's say, for example, um, uh, everyone's wearing Adidas, and then suddenly they decide they're going to switch to Puma or to Nike or something, and you kind of copy the person next to you and a certain a sort of movement happens and everybody's buying Nike all of a sudden. That in a sense is also a kind of part of the logic of swarm intelligence. So I think the way that society operates is very much based on that kind of logic. Um, in a sense it's individuals who are operating kind of collectively. But for, to buy my for example, I, I, I don't buy the idea of some kind of collective unconscious that Jung would talk about as though we can we dig deep down, we all think the same way. I, I rather follow the idea of Freud is Freud's notion about we are all individuals, but at the same time we are individuals who kind of are aware of what other people are doing and then collectively these things kind of begin to sort of emerge. So to my mind, what is it, the, the next step in, in terms of this discourse of emergence is to try and think how, how, in terms of sociology, in terms of kind of history, one can recon reconfigure it as a kind of a social logic that, under, that, that, that defines how society operates. Um, another aspect of, of emergence is uh, stigma G, how uh, uh, an ant, for example, will lay a trail, and other ants would follow that um, that trail. Um, and a typical example of, of, of that logic is, is slime mold, something that um, I guess you get here as well. We certainly get in our damp gardens in England. Um, and slime, what interests scientists first when they, when they first understood slime mold is the fact that it's not a single entity. It's actually a, a whole host of tiny little agents that come together to start foraging for food, and they, they operate uh, collectively as a, as a kind of a single entity. So uh, an example, an experiment was done in, um, in Japan trying to map out how um, if you took slime mold and put little pellets of food that were positioned around a landscape um, to represent where the subway stations were and the, the metro station in, 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 in Tokyo, how they would sort of find certain sort of pathways, optimized pathways. Um, of course, this is simplistic. I mean, I, I think the point is that uh, um, it's not dealing with the kind of the contours or the, or the, the landscape or the or the um, uh, um, or rivers or mountains and so on. Um, but nonetheless, it's kind of interesting experiment to see how how kind of natural systems kind of operate. You can see it, it's heading up the left here, and then it kind of abandons that, withers away, and it consolidates certain dominant pathways. In a sense, that's also how humans operate. This is a photograph I took out of a plane flying back from Beijing once, um, and. And what's interesting is the way the kind of pathways that are being formed by human beings um, in a bottom-up fashion. Um, there was a professor of biology once who had a, a, a new building constructed, and once the building was constructed, they 
they actually, he said, let's, let's ignore the landscape proposal. And let's see what people want to do. And there was one frosty morning when people started making these little pathways and they positioned the landscape, um, or the, the pathways in the landscape, based on the kind of, the, 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 kind of the, the, the pathways that humans themselves had, 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 had produced. So, so there is something there that, that is kind of interesting in its own sort of way. Um, what is, oh my goodness, um, this should be playing, it's not. Um, I hope that doesn't mean that I'm going to focus on the lens. Well, um, okay, sorry. Um, this is, okay. Um, what becomes interesting uh, in terms of, of computation is when you, um, you start taking that logic a little bit further. So if there is a kind of link between ants, uh, brains, cities, and software, how could one possibly kind of lock into the, the logic of swarm intelligence in terms of, of, of generating urban formations? This is the work of um, Roland Smith um, from Pukuja, um, uh, working with uh, Rob Stewart Smith, where they explored the possibility of these pathways that then um, became a, a project from Melbourne that was published in, in Digital Cities. Um, what is interesting also about the work from of Kukuja, and I think Roman is probably the primary person pushing these things, but this is a small scale sort of study uh, of, uh, of, of using processing to generate um, form, is that it looks incredibly similar to the synapses of the brain. And it's not no coincidence because they are, in some senses, following that same same logic. Um, so this is Roland, and maybe I'll just play you a little bit of, of Roland. Um, there's a video of him, swarms of Romans, actually. Um, uh, talking about uh, swarm intelligence. Our own project is to design the exhibition. So part of this is about designing the display system for the work. Um, and part of this is about making an exhibition which is an exhibit in itself. This many facets to the foundation working with work model, who's doing the composites. Now the, the fiberglass structure is only about four millimeters thick. So it's something which is um, it's very, very thin, um, it's, it's very strong. And it gains its strength through its geometry. So the bodies are inlaid into the, uh, into the surface. The, the height of those give it a certain structural depth. They operate like beams. A lot of our work is about the relationship between robotics and algorithmic design. So it's asked the question what does it mean to bring in the technologies from the new industrial paradigm and what implications will they have for architecture? So, on the one hand, the digital work that we're doing, we're looking at algorithms such as those which come from swarm intelligence. So it's this idea that a series of very small things will interact to give, give rise to the emergence of architecture on the large scale. So swarm intelligence, it's a concept that comes from uh, complexity theory that really describes the relationship between individual entities, we call them agents, and the way these agents interact. In much the same way that, say, a flock of birds interacts with a small fish or even something like a slime mold, where all of these entities, all these agents, have very little intelligence or decision making themselves. But collectively, they're capable of solving common problems, and capable of generating highly emergent behavior. And it's this behavior that we're really interested in as a way of thinking about architectural design. The robots we're using are, they come from the manufacturing industry, particularly the automotive industry, large robotic arms to steal on a car and assembly lines. These are very generic tools. They have no particular application. So what we're now doing is designing particular tools going into them. And we've begun to realize that if you design the tool at the same time you design the project, each can influence the other. So rather than either designing to the constraints of the tool that you know, or designing something perhaps quite whimsical digitally, and then trying to develop a tool that can achieve that, we're interested in feedback between the two. So when you start the project, it's very much about wanting to achieve a certain type of a certain type of line, a certain type of form. And realizing that there's certain eccentricities to uh, the robot, which makes that very difficult. And so then you start to realize, oh, what is it? It does well. Um, and then how does that influence how we design? So design intention becomes a sort of a feedback, a feedback with the tools. There's a subtle but important difference between the type of nonlinear algorithmic design that we're working with and parametric design. So parametrics is describing a linear relationship between uh, the parameter and geometric manipulation. Uh, so this is something which is causal. What we're interested in is the way it's constant feedback between what comes out of the algorithm and what comes back into the algorithm. So through that feedback loop, it's able to generate what we describe as a complex system. So something which is capable of generating emergent outcomes, as opposed to the linear causal parametric process, which is making something which is a far more direct relationship um, to the algorithm. We see this very, very much as an architectural prototype. 
it's not simply, it's not a sculpture, it's not an art piece. It's something that's trying to deal with architectural problems. It's trying to deal with problems of the relationship between structure and order and service. Um, so I think the important point that Norman's making there is, is that he's uh, distancing his logic of, uh, of looking algorithmically from a kind of parametric view. I think I, I'm very nervous about Patrick Schumacher's discourse of parametrics because he lumps it all together, as though it's a kind of part of the same process. It's not. Um, uh, uh, one is agent-based and one is a parametric. It's a very different way of operating. Um, one of the examples of, of uh, Roland's work is um, he's now teaching at RIT in Australia, um, where Lisa Andrushek is now based. Um, and you can see this is a, um, a ceremony, ceremonial base. Um, it was produced uh, using processing um, and then 3D printed using uh, entertaining. Um, and it, I think it gets across some of the kind of the, the exquisite uh, nature of what you can produce with this kind of logic. Um, uh, Rod is also is now involved in a, in a series of other explorations, actually in a number of buildings on site. But uh, I guess you get a sense from these early studies of the kind of the, the logic that, that can come out of this uh, way of operating. Um, this was a collaboration that he did with Tom Wiscombe. Um, uh, and then more recently, well, this wasn't constructed, but there have been some, there are been some buildings constructed now in Australia. So it's it's kind of becoming a um, something that's becoming mainstream in some senses. Uh, some work that he did with his students at the Penn, where he's teaching Cecil Barman, um, uh, and then more recent work, and then some stuff that was coming out from, um, from RMIT. Uh, also now at RMIT is um, Alisa Andrushek, um, who I think gave a lecture here some years ago. Um, no? Okay. Um, Alisa was my student actually at Columbia for a while, but not, she, I, in my theory class, that is. Um, this is actually not a uh, processing block, this is um, uh, when I scripted. Um, inverse kinematics, where the sort of structure is a bit like the elbow, but where the elbow is connected. In the left hand side, you can see the logic that is kind of behind it, the right hand side is the word cloaked, and the other success of kind of uh, a visual manifestation, it's not necessarily physically kind of made. But is she, uh, and, uh, I guess there was a trajectory. Carl Chu was the one who taught Elisa, Elisa taught Roland Snook, so Roland's teaching other people, and so on and so on. You get these kind of genealogies of kind of ways of thinking that. Um, emerge from this. This is the Sarusi Pavilion uh, project that she did six or eight years ago now, um, uh, and so on. Um, and then more recent work from uh, the Bartlett. Uh, she was at the AA teaching DRL, then moved to the Bartlett, and now is a professor at, uh, at RMIT. Um, and then a 3D printed uh, model of some of the, the genetic designs. Uh, Elisa tends to work uh, in collaboration with, with um, uh, computer geeks, um, Tavia Schlimm is the one behind that previous one. Ezio Blasetti also has been working collaborating with her on a number of projects. Ezio now teaches, as a take in Roland's place, teaching at UPenn um, with Cecil Bauman, um, and he's also someone who's working in, in the realm of, of multi agent systems. Um, another kind of rising figure is uh, Gilles Retzen, who's uh, now taken over uh, Alisa Andrushek's role. So he was a student uh, of the DRL. So you can see how it, kind of, it, it, it goes on, and he's now running the, the master's program at the Bartlett. Um, this was his project that he did for him as a the DRL student at the AA, um, uh, and uh, more recent work that uh, um, he's been doing. Um, I guess what is interesting about this thing is the way that it kind of throws up possibilities that maybe one wouldn't have imagined otherwise, and that's part of the, kind of the appeal of, of, of the computational work. Um, Casey Rehm was a student of Rowan's, and he's now teaching in SIARC. Um, this is some of the work that he's kind of doing. Um, um, and the other Casey, uh, Casey Reese, um, is the one who developed uh, processing uh, as a student at MIT with a guy called um, Ben Fry. Um, and thank you for this time. I'll just, let me just show you um, Casey talking about processing. Things start off with drawing and sketching, like they often do. Um, the 
then from there they, they progress into, into code. So that's a process where you basically open up a uh, text editor and start writing down your thoughts. Um, but instead of, for example, writing uh, a poem or an essay or fiction, um, the thoughts are more about uh, organizing logic and procedures. Um, and in my case, they always make images. So it goes from an idea of what an image might be to some code that then, that then creates an image again. At that point, back and forth, you pick one and you make a lot of iterations on that, and you find your way through it. Um, but there's never really in, any end goal, but there's a lot of things that happen. The original inspiration was my interest in this idea of emergence. This idea of emergence is that you, you put a few simple rules together and something comes out of that which is entirely unexpected and moves beyond what you can imagine those simple rules producing. So if you're a composer, the final piece you produce is a score. That is your, your end piece. And I think a lot of the instructions that I write or the software that I write is being scored. And in, in the case of the music performance, you know, every performance is different because the, the performer injects their interpretation on top of that. Um, in my case, every kind of software from performers perform differently um, in software by the computer, and some elements unfold differently every time. I think that's a really exciting way to work with computers because, I mean, stereotypically, they're such calculating, precise machines. Um, being able to allow unexpected things to happen is an exciting way to work with.
a couple of um, points came out about that. that he, one thing he says that uh, he, can, he uses not only top down, but also bottom up. And one of the essays in Swarm Intelligence is by Kevin Kelly, where he says the, the title is the, bot, the bottom up is not enough. And if you think about it, I mean, Wikipedia is a good example of a kind of bottom up process. You know, instead of the, the old days, maybe it's volume, 25 volume Encyclopedia Britannica or whatever, and you now get to uh, Wikipedia. But even Wikipedia isn't totally bottom up. There are a bunch of editors who are part of that kind of process. And I said, certainly uh, the AA, Mike Weinstock and several others were kind of always talking about emergence. And all this architecture is the opposite of that, actually. We're, we're kind of top down. Um, so you never quite get that sort of pure separate um, uh, notion of, of a of bottom up process. The second thing I heard is there was a book on his shelf I noticed that was uh, about and interactivity, and that, in some ways, emergent also emergent also explains the way in which we operate um, in terms of interactive engagements. You know, if there's a wall or something that is moving in response to our particular behaviours, then even though there are only two agents involved, you still have a kind of multi agent system, and the whole thing takes on a, a kind of life of its own. So it's the thinking actually can go to many other sort of arenas. So Casey's based at UCLA, and in many ways, LA itself has become a centre. Uh, for uh, processing, I said in case you remember, for Satoru is uh, teaching also at SciArc. He was um, he's a Japanese computer scientist who studied architecture at UCLA and has been collaborating with. Uh, he used to work for Morphosis, um, and some of the Morphosis buildings are um, incorporating sort of uh, uh, processing work that, that that he's been responsible for. Um, uh, also, I think what's interesting about this community, uh, which again is what uh, Casey was talking about, is how it's open, because it's open source, it's kind of changing the way in which we kind of operate. People it's free the software, and people are contributing to it in, a, in, a, in an astonishing sort of way, and leaving their tutorials online. So it's not as though you have to kind of have someone here teaching uh, processing to, be able to find out about. There are so many tutorials online. Perhaps the most significant person uh, from that point of view is Jose Sanchez, who is at USC again in LA, and Jose Sanchez has a, a whole series of, uh, he collaborated also with Ali Sandershek, um, he has a whole series of online tutorials um, called the Plethora Project, um, uh, not just processing, but, but um, other, other uh, software languages as well. Um, so there's something out there, and what's interesting, I guess, in some ways about the way that these, um, these open source systems are operating is that compared to sort of corporate mentality, of, say someone like uh, uh, Autodesk or something where you have a problem, you kind of you ask them a question and three weeks later maybe somebody answers it. Uh, if you actually engage directly with the person who wrote the, the script, you will get an, an immediate answer back. So things are kind of shifting in terms of the way that we're developing software. So anyway, Roland and I, uh, this actually the book has taken a while to come out. Initially we had an exhibition in, in uh, uh, Shanghai. I see how old it is because you haven't got the Shanghai Tower yet. Um, in the background. Uh, 2010, we had an exhibition on school intelligence um, where um, we put together um, the work that was being done kind of in terms of mainly to do architectural design, although the book itself also looks at other aspects, sociology and other aspects we're going to think about in terms of um, the impact of uh, school intelligence. And this is some of the work that we showed. Um, this is youth pen work that uh, came out of uh, this studio with Cecil Barman. Um, Casey Reese's work that we saw just now. Uh, this is the Kuja work, um, and this is work by Lisa Andrushek with, with Jose Sanchez, and uh, here's a video of, of, um, uh, of that particular collaboration. Um, I guess what's interesting about this is when you, 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 you kind of relinquish possibilities, and you, you relinquish a certain degree of uh, authorship to the way the agents themselves are generating these forms, and uh, it's a different way of, of approaching uh, how we think about um, uh, about architecture. I guess what I remember there was a, a review at the AA many years ago where there was one student who was talking about his work and he said, uh, well, there are six possibilities. Normally there's six or ten or twelve, some kind of magic number. And uh, I wasn't very convinced by his project. And then another student came in who was very, very good and he said, I looked at the possibilities and I ran them through the computer and there are 564. And to be honest, 485 of them are really boring, but here they are. I think that's the kind of the thing that. Uh, it really just kind of pushes open the boundary or the, uh, the, 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 the scope of how we can um, think about architectural um, approaches. Um, um, that's not to say it's not without its problems, and maybe I'll touch upon that, but uh, uh, it's one of the, the kind of forays into sort of challenging the kind of the way in which we've traditionally been thinking about architectural kind of systems. So, um, 
scrutinized one. So this is uh, some work coming out of, this is Jose Sanchez's work from the AADRL. On the right hand side is some of my student work at USC, where we're using um, the processing. Um, uh, uh, Prosa Roche on the right hand side, um, uh, some of his work. And one of the few projects that this work we showed that was not architectural um, is by Marco Doriga. Marco Doriga was one of the original um, um, uh, authors of the Swarm Intelligence book that came out from the Saturday Institute. And he works on swarm robotics. Maybe I'll, I'll just show you, we've got time I think, to show you a little video of, uh, uh, of the kind of work that he does. It's kind of scary because it looks kind of militaristic, but it's not funded by the military, unlike most things at MIT. Okay. is a heterogeneous robotic swarm made up of three types of robot. The handbot is designed to manipulate objects. The handbot can also climb, but needs help from other robots to move around. The footbot is a wheeled robot with a grip on. Using its grip on, a footbot can form physical connections with other footbots or with the handbot. The eyebot can fly and rapidly explore large areas. It can attach to the ceiling and provide environmental information to the other robots. In this film, the swarmanoid is deployed to find and then retrieve a book. Here, the swarmanoid has already partially explored its environment. As the eyebots search, successive eyebots attach to the ceiling, forming a connected network. Once an eyebot has found the book, the knowledge propagates back to the deployment area. The handbot then requests transport assistance from the footbots. Using the eyebot network, the footbots form a ground-based chain linking the deployment area to the book. Composite footbot handbot entity that follows this ground based chain. The second handbot prepares for transport. The first football handbot entity has rotated and aligns with the bookshelf. Handbook could retrieve another book 
or act as a backup should the first foot off and or fail. In this film, the swarmanoid retrieves a single book. However, the true value of the swarmanoid concept would manifest itself in parallel task execution scenarios and in unstructured environments. Future incarnations of the swarmanoid might be able to replace human workers in hazardous environments, perform search and rescue missions, or even conduct exoplanetary exploration. So, one of the interesting things about that little video is that, um, um, was that actually, I, I didn't notice the word intelligence there. I mean, Marco Dorigo is one of the authors of the, the digital book, Swarm Intelligence, but he doesn't use the word intelligence. And for sure, if we're talking about intelligence and swarm intelligence, it is very low level intelligence. Um, the question is always, to what extent does it need to be programmed? I mean, I guess the best example of a, of a form of intelligence is, is, is the slime mold model that I showed you, the searching out sort of, sort of pathways. Um, so to some extent, then, it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's open to debate to what extent we can sort of see this as a, as a kind of form of, 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 of intelligence itself. Anyway, this was the exhibition that we, um, we had in, uh, in, in Shanghai um, uh, um, some time back now um, at the Hong Kong Study Center. This was a presentation that um, Ron Suits and I gave at the Admitted of Campos Austria Pavilion at the Shanghai 2010 Expo. And this was some of the work that we did with the students. Um, one thing I'd say also about, uh, um, about its, uh, processing is that the real, one of the problems is, is the kind of feedback loop. In, in a way, it's not performative. This might look like structural logics to it. It's like these fibers, these uh, membranes are kind of like uh, held together, but actually they're not structural. So um, uh, it essentially, it's a kind of, it is kind of a visual sort of language. Um, and this was a project that we did with our students um, there. I, to my mind, it's a kind of way, you know, I think one has to approach this in a very critical way. Um, to what extent do these uh, new tools uh, afford new opportunities? And I think the word affordance and the whole logic of affordance that comes out of J.J. Gibson is an important one here. He doesn't force you to do certain things, but it opens up. But he doesn't, has no agency, unlike the idea in discourse. At the same time, it opens up possibilities. I, I think as, as educators, we have a responsibility to, um, to uh, be kind of to explore these ideas in a kind of critical fashion. Um, and I guess speaking as a kind of a, as a theorist, what I find disappointing is the way a lot of theorists uh, dismiss these things um, uh, for reasons I don't quite understand. I mean, I think uh, uh, it's often regarded, computation is regarded as being um, uh, superficial, apolitical, asocial, and so on. And yet, if you've been in the States recently, you'll know that you know, the world of the computer is precisely the most political tool you could possibly imagine. Not in terms of, in terms of the tweets you're getting, but also the kind of cyber warfare that's been going on that Ben Bratton writes so eloquently about. And I also think there's a danger that one kind of conflates the kind of cultural conditions in which these things have emerged with the things themselves. In other words, the, the notion of superficiality, well, we've had that since learning from Las Vegas. Don't blame the computer for that. The computer essentially is a tool that we program to do whatever it is that one doing. Um, and I, I personally, as, a, as a somebody, and I often criticize as someone who used to work at Alberti as kind of abandoning humanism and, and entering this kind of world of post-humanism or something. Well, to my mind, Alberti or Brunelleschi, they would have been absolutely fascinated with these technologies, especially Brunelleschi. Can you imagine Brunelleschi with a 3D printing robot for, um, for, the, for the Florence Cathedral? Um, anyway, so I, I maybe I'll, I'll leave it there and we can have some time for some, some questions. Um, Thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, so, so sure that there are a number of questions. Uh, um, I'm going to just maybe start to get the conversation going. Uh, then we'll, we'll open it up for um, the collective intelligence of the audience, the small intelligence. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the, I had I wanted to, to to throw at you like a large number of, of problems, and one of them I think you already uh, hit there and, and somehow solved a little bit. Um, but to but to be um, but to put it in, in, a, in, a, in a short uh, formula, let's say, 
Um, uh, for me, one of I, I wanted to ask you three questions, and, and you maybe choose what to answer if you if you like them. Uh, one of them is more of a historical sort, and it's um, it's about the fact that um, we we've been let's say uh, playing around with, uh, with with digital technology for at least 20 or 25 years in architecture and. And, and we've been talking about the digital revolution, but then the question there would be, if you think that, let's say, um, after these this two, two and a half decades, we are uh, in a kind of uh, normal science period, let's say, in, in, in terms of uh, Thomas Kuhn, let's say, where uh, the, the, the revolutionary moment has passed and now we are kind of stabilized and exploring a kind of uh, normal, more normalized territory, or uh, if, if, if we are in a kind of constant uh, upheaval of, of things where uh, we are, let's say, um, discovering uh, critical issues all the time and perhaps mapping a, a, a future that is constantly evolving and uncertain. So that, that would be one uh, question, let's say, a more like historical question. Um, I think it's important to be critical, and that's really kind of what, what my, uh, the basis of my work in critical theory was all about. The idea that you know, if you can establish a problem as a problem, you're no longer trapped by it, you can see it as a problem. Therefore, criticality, and criticality is not to demolish something. You know, I think the way that, for example, in rethinking architecture, people like Philip Jameson were writing about Kenneth Frampton, or Adorno was writing about Alf Lewis, they were kind of pointing out the problems of the argument. Not to demolish the argument, but not to expose the problems that they could be so the argument could be reinforced. So I think criticality is an important sort of thing, and I think we, we, we suffer at the moment. There's a in the, the, the idea that I'm doing. Uh, I have an interview with Paola Antonelli, who's the, the curator of the Museum of Modern Art, and she's been really quite progressive in in, in, in in sponsoring and promoting the digital there. Um, but she refers to what she calls a drunken moment. You know, in the sense you get kind of euphoric about the possibilities of all these kind of things and then suddenly there's a bubble bursts and we, we find ourselves in a kind of like a, a different situation. And I, I guess I, I wonder, my, my, my contribution to that AD is precisely that, in the sense that you know, the architects think they, oh, we can 3D print everything. We can 3D print buildings, we can 3D print cities, and so on and so on and so on. Well, actually, I, I don't think that's the case. You know, I think one of the things that we found in terms of 3D printing is that uh, economically, for another reason, because people are working for Iris Earth and doing these kind of outfits and things. And uh, it's very large, small scale operations that we're doing at the moment. But then, from a kind of theoretical point of view, I don't know too theoretical here, but um, Mamma Delano talks about the difference between um, uh, intensive and extensive. And we think we are, we are extensive thinkers of life. We think, see things in vision. So we have a, it's a bit like the movie Powers of Tech. You know? People are kind of, with a computer, zooming in and zooming out. And you're, you're producing things that are ever larger and smaller, so you get Zaha designing jewelry, like the cities and so on. And there's a danger there, because actually there are different intensive performances that need to be taken into account. There's a reason why an ant looks like it does with spindly legs, and an elephant looks like it does with sturdy legs. It's to do with the kind of the, you can't just zoom things up, you've got to take account of stress levels and so on. So King Kong is a picture. You would never get a gorilla 10 times the size of that, nor would you get a plastic building. Produce set out of size. So there are all these kind of different kind of constraints that we brought in. We have to be more critical about those things. And I, I, I personally think that actually 3D printing will be a very modest in its, its, its possibilities in the future. So, um, yeah. So I agree with you, yeah. Um, so let me go on with, a, with, a, with another issue. Um, I think that the, the second, the second uh, question that I had for you was. Um, Related to an aesthetic issue, an aesthetic uh, dimension of, of the presentation, and that would be, um, I guess, perhaps it's pretty obvious, but I still uh, think it would be interesting to hear what, what you, how you, you would put it. Um, it's the question of what is it that you think that triggers the subjective response in the case of, for example, when you show where you were showing the the, the flock of, of birds, right? I mean, the, the, it's, this is a phenomenon, but one thing is for this phenomenon to be there and to be observed, perhaps with a with a scientific uh, mindset or, or interest, and another thing is for it to be looked at with a, with an aesthetic uh, interest. And so, I guess we are not the first ones to have witnessed this phenomena, uh, but uh, for for some reason it seems that 
we are we, we seem to be uh, I'm not sure if I would say the first, but you know the first to specifically see a certain set of potentials in that kind of organization, in that kind of process. So um, why is that? I, I think that, the, well, a lot of the work actually that has been done in this area is slightly disingenuous, in the sense that um, people are focusing on processes and natural systems and so on, but in the end they want to make it beautiful. That's always the kind of interesting kind of question. And I certainly, um, I mean, as much as I like Mike Weinstock, these interesting characters, you know, uh, and the MTEC group there that he's got at the AA, it's all about performance. Then if you look at anything he writes, or the illustration anything he writes, it's always exquisitely beautiful examples from nature. And I think there's a, in some ways, there is a dialectical operation that's at work there. Um, I mean, um, Adorno would criticize Adolf Mills for precisely the same kind of question. I mean, in some ways, we're getting a reiteration of that kind of debate, you know, where uh, Luce is kind of criticizing art and saying everything must be kind of functional. But the point that Adorno makes is that some of the dialectical, there's nothing that is so uh, technical, it's not designed, and many arty things have a kind of function. You think about dance having a, a kind of social function. So there is something kind of disingenuous going on here. Um, but in some ways, and from a Deleuzean point of view, they, they do, as I said, they kind of have a sort of a precept, they do fold in one into one another. I guess the difficult thing is, is that we're trying, to, um, we're trying to shift the emphasis away from a kind of postmodern, scenographic, image, totally image-based thing towards uh, something that's really trying to understand the process of or, or privilege that you don't lose the other half. So that's why I'm, part of the reason I'm critical about Patrick and, and the narrow part of so because they see it just in terms of a kind of style that actually has to do with the other process-based thing, but at the same time, uh, Patrick's kind of right in the sense that, you know, if it doesn't look right, you kind of, you tweak the program and run it again until it does look right, so... Okay, um, I, I don't know if maybe uh, we can open it up, otherwise I can, I can come up with more. <laughs> I, yeah, well, I, 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 I'll do the third one, because I, because I think it's interesting. Um, no, the other the other thing was the, the political one. It's the, the political question. And you said at the, at the end you were talking about uh, you know, the fact that it's not the political. Um, and then you gave a, a few examples of how uh, the technology is politicized right now in the, in the U.S. completely. Um, but but at the same time, uh, it's true also that I think during the. 2000s, perhaps uh, beginning in the 2000s, after after 9/11 and after the dot-com crash and all those things, uh, there was a lot of um, let's say criticism towards uh, a certain perhaps naivete uh, in the digital uh, research, and, and and perhaps there was there was a fair accusation there in terms of the relationship between what we call emergence or what the theoreticians of, of complexity call emergence and the idea of liberalism, which is the idea that there is a, the, the hidden hand, let's say, that organizes, uh, that organizes the, the functioning of the market. And I, I know I'm simplifying things a lot here, and I don't mean to reduce the problem of, uh, of complexity to a problem of liberalism versus whatever. Um, but I think that there's a fair uh, issue that, is, uh, um, that, that was brought up there, and, and I'm wondering um, how do you position this, uh, you know, in relationship with the notion that um, that there might be a, a, a liberal um, a liberal discourse uh, embedded in, in, in much of the discourse, in, the, in much of the of these practices, of these practices. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to say that in a kind of demeaning way, uh, but just to, to bring it up to, to understand if that is the case. Um, uh, this is a... I should have published a book by now called This Politics of Space. That's something I've been thinking about for some time, and I've written about it, but I haven't finished the book yet. And I, one thing about the politics that... Um, I once went to a lecture by someone from Tehran, uh, she's in, to a PhD at MIT on the urban planning, who was, she's trying to argue that the, the, the revolution happened in Tehran because of the urban formation of Tehran and the street layout and so on. 
um, which struck me as being absurd. But I, I think there's a kind of danger that people uh, overinvest their own discipline with a certain political efficacy. <coughs> Uh, especially architects. You know, actually, what what agency do we have? You know, really working for a client in some ways. The only, the only real influence we can have is maybe to specify a more environmentally sound material and things. Um, in the end, it's the client who's kind of like the, uh, the, the, the person. And I, I, so I, I always see like uh, artists like hairdressers. You know, they you go to the hairdresser and someone says, "Give me a short back and side." You do that kind of thing. So I, I and I, I think that's. One needs to go to Foucault to look at that and to see his kind of discourse in Space, Knowledge, and Power, where he says that actually the architect has no power over it. The form that doesn't, architect, politics doesn't reside in form. It's really, politics is politics. So in a sense, it, from that point of view, it's a question, to go back to the question about affordance, it's a question about maybe for, in terms of architectural space, what kind of political gathering can be afforded by a particular kind of space? You can't have a kind of football game in a telephone kiosk, for example. So you know, in a way, I think we have to be sort of skeptical about the way in which we kind of use the term kind of political. It's not the system that's necessarily wrong. So capitalism is not necessarily wrong. So that's why I disagree with Patrick again. He thinks it's fantastic. Uh, artists think it's sort of bad, but at the same time, they're very happy to take the money for their artwork. It's really how you use a system, how you use a room. So the politics is, is, is embedded in the kind of the use and the performances that are going on a particular kind of space. So that's my position on that, which is maybe not um, the same as anyone else's. And it kind of infuriates people in a way, um, and I can see that. But, but uh, uh, I think one has to be very careful about the use of the term politics, which is banded around um, too often in architecture. Um, so does that answer the question? Um. So there's, there's something inherently liberal about this. I think the point is, is that, you know, the, that's what was pointed about Luca Buzia, who was kind of like, claiming that his buildings would somehow prevent revolution. No, I, I'm not trying to say that this, let's say, swarm intelligence. I'm not trying to say that swarm intelligence is uh, inherently liberal. I'm trying to say that, or that any other architecture is like straightforwardly embodying a kind of political model. But what I'm trying to say is whether it's echoing a certain political idea, uh, without necessarily being conscious of it. If anything, I think you could see it, it on the other sense, on the other end, the certain um, spectrum. I think that the fascism was often was based on that, the collective mass behavior. So uh, I, my, it's not, I, would, I would see the danger of the opposite. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, that may open it for the public to participate. Uh, hi. Um, I I was I was thinking uh, kind of in a, in the second question that you know, I was posing, taking taking on that, that you've been uh, kind of mentioning this opposition with parametricism and the idea of emergence as something that in, in some of the cases when like when this video of Casey Reese was playing and, and he was saying that um, there was not an, an objective in a way like emergence was like an open uh, ended kind of situation where there was not necessarily a search for a certain emergence, but it, it happened. It said like it, it, there are certain certain set of rules, and then things happen, right? And and I was and I was wondering if if that is not um, uh, a problem in terms of the tension between when you were mentioning at the beginning the flock of birds had had reasons why they were behaving that way. Like it was because they were getting uh, like a, um, a temperature of their bodies to, to be called uh, like for the night, and, and the video was mentioning a, a set of things. So th there was an objective for that behavior in a way. And and but the the question would be if if you think that maybe this uh, this necessity to have a, a another side to parametrism because in itself it is it is I, I can see it is it is a problem of how it is posed in architecture and has taken over in, in so many ways of doing and, and, and I I don't know, I, I feel like I see something there in, in what you're saying that is very important so that, that there should be a way of thinking about architecture that 
uh, is not merged into that confusion anymore. But then um, it doesn't it doesn't seem to to end to to sum up to uh, to another proposition, you know, like or if you think that there is a proposition, because to me it felt like then it lacks attention when you know there is like the biomimicry side of the thing, the responsive, um, the, the image, the kind of zero friction, more like beauty uh, search. And I don't know, my question, uh, my common question sort of thing, if, if, if you feel like there is enough tension to actually think that this, this set of things is uh, a single uh, proposition or of there is a, it's not enough uh, of a kind of congruent group, you know? Or, or what is about that? Um. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I just need to clarify, I, I think parametrism is all wrong. Okay, the full thesis, I wrote an essay, an essay uh, parametrism explained, trying to explain the difference. I mean, partly from a technical point of view, I think Patrick is confusing these different operations. Algorithmic is not the same as parametric, nor is it the same as explicit modeling, and he seems to wrap it all up with pre computational stuff as it's a style. That's one thing that the technical, technical discovery is, is, is like this. Misguided. I think also I have problems in terms of the idea of being a universal style. It seems to be very modernist. And then the visual dimension to it kind of postmodern in a kind of curious way. So it's a very confused entity. So I, I would want to distance myself, and I do, um, from that. Uh, Patrick is now writing for um, from the AD and doing on 3D printed body architecture, and he has a new theory called tectonism, which is basically from the opposite, which is like the Akimenga's approach, which is kind of co opting and calling it a subset of. This parametrism style, which I find outrageous, you know. Um, so that's why I, I, I would. I don't even use the word parametric myself, but, um, or, or as uh, Wolf Pritz calls it, uh, parapatric. Um, so, uh, I, so, but I think I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the 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 fish. The reason why they're doing the, the schooling and things is because you know they're protecting themselves. The sardines. There's a shark coming and so on. It's, it's a mechanism of protection. There's normally there is some motive at the end of the thing. It doesn't happen. Kind of just, uh, they're not doing it just to, for, to be happy. You know? it's, 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 there's an objective in, in mind. But I think I would also say that there's kind of like, in a way, so I was just presented a simple version of it, the early version of it. And I think secondary versions of that have begun to, or secondary research into that, have, have, they found out that actually there are certain birds that do call the shots, you know, and they, they're the dominant, whatever it is, that do. So that, that video description actually is probably right. The dominant males are maybe. Um, in some ways, sort of controlling things. So I think there, there's also, you know, I don't think it's completely um, the differences between um, between birds and fish and, and human beings. That, that's that's simplistic too, you know. I think but nonetheless, I think it's a, as a as a provocation, um, it's it's kind of useful. Um, so and I think you're up in the sense of well, you know, the the, the the video of those kind of slightly militaristic kind of robots, you know, doing their things. That was actually a bit troubling as well because. Really, that program to get the book, you know, and it's not about bottom-up process of then finding that. that. That's one of the problems, really, about processing is that it hasn't got any particular. Um, there's no feedback in it at all. I mean, and that's a problem with a lot of computational models, like L systems. Well, plants don't grow like L systems. You know, they hit the scene, they bounce back or something. You know, there's, it's a model that doesn't work very well in the studio. And what we found out was actually the agents know very well where they are and then where the other agents are. But they, do, they don't respect the terrain very well, and so on. So there are all sorts of problems with this. And I'm not saying it's necessarily. Uh, it's, it's, but I think you're absolutely right. There's, there's, there's something there which needs to be. Um, uh, you know, what is the objective? And so on. And, when it, and one of the real questions that, that, that people always put to Casey Reese and, and other and to Ron Suits as well is when you've got because processing doesn't stop. It's actually continuous. So when do you freeze? It? Which is exactly the question that was put to Greg Lynn when he was doing this. And in form, when and why do you have to freeze that kind of thing? So, um, so it's a good question, and I think it's a, really it's important to have those questions out there to be critical about it. Because I, I'm, I'm skeptical of those who don't, criti who, who are uncritical, like Patrick, who just thinks it's the they have manifestos. All manifestos are undialectical; they, they don't, uh, they're not balanced out. I have kind of uh, uh, three thing uh, question. 
maybe the first one you kind of um, answer it or partially answer it uh, with the one of the uh, the, the conversation with the style, Patrick. But um, I, I I kind of wonder from a disciplinary point of view, like about maybe three things that I'm thinking about when you were when you were speaking. Um, one is that maybe not the the, the the theme of the style, maybe the, the idea of visualization, because there's I don't know uh, in the 90s the. Uh, these, these guys that uh, use uh, uh, computers uh, didn't know how to render, but then they know how to render, so they're uh, constructing some kind of uh, machinery, uh, maybe from the, the 2000s to now. Uh, there is, that it has a kind of, uh, I don't know if I can call it style, but uh, I don't know, a tendency or a trend, maybe. Um, that is, of course, different from uh, parametricism like in a linear way, but it has some uh, visualization style or, I don't know, a way of showing the work that is very particular. If you can, I don't know how that relates to uh, the previous discipline, pre the pre-computer, pre-digital discipline. Um, yeah. One of the points I made was that I think we are all operating in a kind of sworn intelligence ourselves. You know, in a way, if you're an architect, if you copy Rem Kohlhaas, you're going to fail, right? But if you do something a little bit like Rem Kohlhaas, but slightly different, which is a good project, right? If you produce a pineapple, they'll, people will say, well, excuse me, I think you're doing something fruit or something. It's the, it, so architecture is always kind of very much aware of the kind of model and of the collective kind of behaviors in some kind of way. So. Uh, but there's an aesthetic one that's clearly kind of in the sense people are buying into. Um, the, to my mind, the, the, the radical difference you get in, in terms of using the computer, one of the things is, is this zooming in, zooming out, the powers of temper, which I think is really changes one's way of thinking. Because in the old days, we did a drawing, you, you, you did a drawing kind of 1 to 20, 1 to 50, 1 to 100, whatever. It was specified in advance, and now we're just zooming in and zooming out in different kind of ways. So thinking about the world completely differently, but also, um, when I was a student, because I was at the very beginning of the computer that we had to go and do in Cambridge, had to go and do it the analog way. You know, and the way you compose a, a building was kind of, you know, it was always done on plan section elevations, you know, and somehow you computed that internally to get a sense of what the building really looked like. But now people are building three dimensional models in the first place, and I think that's changing the way that we're thinking about architecture. It becomes more kind of very esque in a way, more kind of sculptural as a kind of way of thinking. So it's not as though the tools forced to do something, but they kind of open up certain possibilities, certain ways of thinking, and people are kind of copying other people. So, um, I, I mean, there's, a, there's an effect. There's an effect that comes out of that. But I think style is a different kind of question. If you start, you kind of, you think about things, and like, I want to make it look like this kind of thing. Um, in England, we have a building with the Brighton Pavilion. On the outside, it looks like it's, uh, it's Indian. On the inside, it's completely Chinese. You know, and you want to, but those days, it's kind of proto-postmodernism. You could design according to a kind of certain style. I think what's happening now is, is less that and seeing what comes out of the process and then maybe manipulating it slightly to, to change it. But it's not quite the same logic as the kind of preconceived, determined, predetermined logic you're, tr they say logic you're trying to follow. Um, I don't know if I asked that. Um, the, the second part was about um, scale, like um, how this uh, swarm intelligence idea or uh, agenda is working through scales or between scales or in different scales or sizes. Like, uh, I don't know, you show um, some photos of uh, cities, of part of cities or complete cities or even later like uh, structures like uh, surfaces or pavilions, how does uh, it works in, in between scales? If there's a kind of, a, a, I don't know, a discourse about it or a different way to approach ideas from different sizes. And um, the third one is about how uh, this, um, I don't know, these uh, projects uh, or this approach to the discipline 
uh, speaks or generates some kind of dialogue to like more traditional ideas of typology. Uh, this maybe has, has to do with some um, visualization problems, like, uh, I don't know, finally they are, build, they are constructing buildings, they are constructing houses, and some of them are kind of, uh, I don't know, they can be used in a more traditional way. How is this, how can these processes help, uh, I don't know, distort or uh, make some kind of superation or elevation of uh, the idea of typology or the traditional idea of typology? Scale, I don't know that. That's an interesting thought. But no, I, I, I think we'll have to look at the specific manifestation of that, of, of a, the of a strong intention behavior to be able to think about that. But the question about, I think I, I tried to touch the thing about typologies. It, it seems to me, what I like about this theory, although it's a new theory, is it can go back in time, a bit like Freud. You know? Freud actually draws upon, most of the models are Greek, Narcissus or Oedipus or something, and yet it's a very kind of 20th century kind of way of thinking. And I think this thing also could be a way of revisiting history. Um, and I think we need to revisit history. That's why I think that Delander's book is so important. You know, it's less the kind of bizarre notion of how we understand what the city's about and what the history's about, and more about like, the different logics that come into it. I mean, I, what I was trying to suggest was that the, the typology is precisely an emergent operation. You know, as a, a, a kind of like a, a type of building will be incrementally changed. You'll see the previous one will improve it slightly, and that's really, I think, what I think it's just kind of about and type of is about. Is, is that that missing something? Else? Thank you. Um, hi, I have two questions. Um, we we'll two or three questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first thing is, um, I was hearing, um, I remember when you mentioned Alanda, uh, he also mentioned an artist, uh, William Layton, maybe you are aware of it, um, which was uh, experiment, uh, experimenting with uh, some kind of evolutive art, or revolutionary art. Um, in the early 80s, um, so from then to now, um, both, both power and software advanced. Um, how this approach um, have shifted uh, the architectural basis or the particular framework, theoretical framework, um, because we uh, said the digital was about 20, 25, 25 years old. If you maybe this swarm, swarmish approach is older, and well, what happened? How uh, the modern precepts of architecture and modern 500 years ago um, shifted from this approach? I think, I think um, so who was the artist again? It was um, uh, in Latin, yeah. I think his comment was about the, the limitation of the gene pool, and therefore the forms all came out to be the same. Um, uh, I, I, what, what, yeah, I mean, one of the things, so I've been trying to, to I submitted an article about why the fact that in 2013, um, Greg Lynn said there's no theory of digital technology yet. Um, and actually there isn't. If you think about what we have out there, there are kind of, there are a few monographs um, by people like Maricarpo that seem to be kind of very historical where they're, they're operating. There are some edited collections that are kind of a mixed bag of different things. And there's some fantastic, you know, uh, hard kind of technology stuff by people like um, Skylar Tibbetts and, and those kind of char characters, which is fantastic work, but not very theoretical. So you've got a gap between those two kind of um, schools of thinking. And, and, and that is the kind of the, the, huge, the huge challenge right now. I'm trying to think, why is it that there is no comprehensive thing? I mean, Delander is the one person who could write that because he was a computer programmer, He's, um, uh, but he hasn't done that. Um, 
Why is that? There are a number of different reasons for that. One is the, the skepticism we have, I mentioned before, in the history theory the Christian community. Another one you could say is maybe the kind of the, the death of theory, the kind of Michael Speaks theory, which is, I think, wrong. Um, I think that what we've got is a mutation in terms of the kind of theoretical framework. It's no longer philosophy anymore, but it's more cognitive sciences. We're now dealing with kind of like a AI, neuroscience, other disciplines on top of that, so it's, it's kind of broadened out. Um, and uh, there are, anyway, there's, at the moment there is, and, and one of the reasons also I think is, is the fact that actually the, the part of the problem with these technologies is that when they're developed, Actually, there's a kind of there's a secondary use that they haven't anticipated. What Roberto Becker sort of refers to as a primary use that you design something for, then somehow they get used in different kind of ways. Um, and for example, the cell phone, mobile phone, was not developed in the way that you imagined. If you, if you go to the UK, there's a place called the Car Phone Warehouse. Where, you know, that's where they sell them. You, know, you can't actually use your cell phone in a car these days. But, um, and they, it was designed for businessmen. And then actually what happened, it, it really took off when the businessman gave, a, gave, a, gave it to their daughters and said, okay, give us a call when you want me to pick you up this evening and I'll... So often these things are kind of unpredictable. That is also an emergent thing, behavior, the way that one engages in these technologies. Um, so at the moment, I, I don't think we're in a position yet to know quite what it, it is to get our heads around it. But I would say that it's kind of shifted totally from the early days. I mean, I think that they, when I think about the 90s, there was people talking about virtual reality, as though it was a kind of almost reality and so on. And nobody even uses that term except for you know, Oculus Rift these days. So um, I think we're, we're kind of we're, we're, we're becoming more, more, more skeptical and more critical. Um, and I think there has been a shift, a, a complete shift from those, those, those um, the utopian days. And I think we're going to go through another one fairly soon, and we're going to. But well, it is part of the way we live in, we, we live in. And I think that uh, that's why I'm interested in people like Ben Bratton, who are really kind of opening up and exposing the ways in which this is going to be, will be changing our society in terms of global, global kind of uh, cyber crime and all those kind of questions. Um, so, I mean, things have changed, and I don't know where they're going, or how, and that's my challenge right now, is how do we understand what's actually happening? Um, it's still emergent in itself, it's not, it's not kind of, Consolidated, there's, there's, it's an ongoing process. Um, maybe I can, I can come up with a, another one. Um, it's more general than than the, than, than the specific lecture, but I, I just I'm really curious to know um, how do you see yourself, your own role in uh, as a theoretician, uh, as a thinker of, of these processes. Uh, in regards to the processes themselves, how do you uh, position yourself? Well, first of all, I, I guess I'm a theorist, but I don't know what theory is. I mean, there's actually a book that's been published recently. There's one in some of the social sciences that was saying, well, there are seven different types of theories. One that came out of architecture that said there are four different types of theory. But well, the comment, I mean, it's kind of a bit superficial, but the comment was made about. Uh, about theory is that the problem right now is that there isn't any overarching concept of theory. It's a bit like recipes. You know, it's almost like judging things based on, on uh, cookery based on, on the fact that they're recipes. Um, uh, so I, 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 I'm not even sure what theory is. This is the thing I'm struggling with at the moment. You know? and I, to my mind, and I, what I'm noticing is you know, because we're all in a very interdisciplinary world right now um, where we're kind of transgressing thresholds and engaging with other areas, but, if you look at science, I mean, their idea of theory is it's just explanation. It's not what my idea of theory is kind of a kind of meta discourse. It's about a theory about a discourse about buildings, in a sense, the literal discourse, which to say it's about ideas, not about buildings as such. And one of the challenges I have trying to publish things in, 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 in digital you know, conferences, everyone says, well, where are the illustrations? Well, if you look at a book by, by Delander, there are no illustrations. You know, he, he's talking about ideas. And, so we're getting one of the things that you come across is that this, uh, when you're, you're, you're operating in this kind of transgressive mode is that uh, you realize the, the limits of what you're operating in. I think uh, Foucault makes this comment that you know, when you transgress the limit, it exposes the limit as limit. So I'm not sure where we are right now and, and what the, the discourse is. This is precisely the reason why I think we should be pushing this and pursuing this. Um, uh, at a certain sort of level, I'm not getting caught up in the technical side of things, but trying to get to a, a kind of meta-narrative where we can sort of see things 
uh, 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 that are more global sort of level. Um, <coughs> but it's been a challenge for me. And um, I'm not going to answer Hi, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, because you were presenting a, a number of um, projects and ways of uh, working, uh, especially uh, work that has been done in the past mostly 10 years, but there is more than that, but mostly kind of focused on the last 10 years, and um, putting all that work under the umbrella, well, that's, that's how I understood it, of uh, of strong intelligence, which was the topic of the lecture. And uh, still, I'm not sure if you're presenting uh, strong intelligence as, a, as, a, as an aesthetic umbrella or as a sort of paradigm that um, overrides a way of doing theory, which is partly what you were just saying, uh, or as a procedural ethics, this behind the making of projects, uh, or as a general pro uh, model of thinking, uh, that transcends architecture, uh, or as any other. No, but, but this idea, uh, no matter how you put it, actually, uh, I mean, probably a first question or something I wonder is how do you how do you regard the idea of some intelligence in that context? But but more importantly, uh, what I'm wondering is if you if you think that this notion that has been there for for a number of, for a couple of decades in architecture. How, how do you see it evolving? How do you, if you see that it has grown in intelligence, the idea itself of strong intelligence, and in what way it has grown in intelligence? Um, so firstly, I say there are many different camps in the area of strong intelligence. I mean, if there is, for example, the engineering does, Swarm particle optimization, which is a very kind of functional way of fosters use that for their facade systems. So it's a kind of pragmatic way of optimizing facades. That's not the way that Roland sees it. He's very much interested in kind of um, an aesthetic section. And I think that's the danger is that it is just used as an aesthetic. Um, I, in my studio, I didn't show the work that I did with my students, but we was really trying to try to see if one could use this with a kind of performative dimension to try and find solutions, which is not at all clear. Um, so I'm, uh, I think that's a really good question. I'm not sure the answer. I think it's that at the moment it's, uh, it, we have, there are all these different genders that are going on. Um, I don't use processes anymore, personally, um, uh, in, in my studio teaching. But um, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, I, 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 um, I like the idea of provocation, of, of, of pushing the boundaries, of opening up possibilities at the same, at the same time. At the same time always being critical about those things. And if I were to be critical myself, I would say that the problem is it is largely an aesthetic. You know, I think actually it lends itself to Casey Reese's work, the kind of posters we saw coming out of UPenn that Roland was doing with his students as a two-dimensional thing. I haven't been able to really get it to work properly um, in the studio in a kind of performative way, which I find a little disappointing. At the same time, I do think that what hasn't been explored is the kind of the, the kind of sociological, historical potential implications of how we might apply it to the way the humans have operated over the years. And I think that's, to my mind, the most interesting possible opening yet to be uh, explored. So um, uh, you, you, you hit it down on the head. It, it's not clear precisely. There are many different kind of uh, aspects of it. And it's not that intelligent, I don't think. And it is, there's a, a large amount of it that is um, highly aesthetic in a sense. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's like processing itself is an ongoing thing. Um, uh, yeah, I, I expected a tough question, so. Yeah. <laughs> we have another one over Um, I was I was wondering about uh, stuff that I believe uh, Ciro and Anna were kind of developing out, and um, my main concern was like this um, this 
the scripts that are constantly like feedbacking themselves and uh, iterating. If architecturally we could, uh, if if you could actually um, foresee or imagine how could it feedback from um, from architectural disciplines history itself, like how could it, um, yeah, um, feedback and construct on 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 concrete disciplinary uh, solutions. I can say. Um, meaning ways of, of generating novelty and, and ways of, of generating an architectural uh, project itself as in, as in for example um, departing a bit from aesthetics if there is a way from for um, Um, yeah, for for architectural, um, uh, let, let's say like spa uh, spatial ideas or um, uh, typologies or um, um, yeah, just um, ma ma architectural materials in general. Like how could, how could those things uh, feedback in this iterative? Um, I don't know if to call it algorithms or what. Um, in ways of, of creating that uh, emergence. Maybe I'll show you something that I wasn't going to show you, just to show what I've done in the studio with my students um, as a way to explore what it might be in terms of architecture. Um, I, I wasn't going to show this, but I, I just, this was a project that we, oops, we did in Dubai. Um, Um, uh, where well, we were interested in, in just exploring the possibility if there is a connection between processing and cities and uh, you know, processing and cities, how could you use processing for an urban, urbanistic kind of proposal? And this one was a, about a particular uh, section of Dubai. We were interested not in this kind of kitsch stuff that's happening out here, but around this area here, uh, the stack here, there's a a very old section of it that's gone out produced, but they have these things called uh, wind towers, that, uh, wind towers, bad gear in, in, in Farsi, um, which capture the wind and operate in a very intelligent way to cool down a building. And, and, to, and one can actually foster some people are now using this natural technique, it's air conditioning without air conditioning kind of thing, uh, and incredibly effective, we were being on these things. And we were exploring the possibility of how we could use that and use processing to try and look at this thing, we're looking, for example, at termites nests, how they cool themselves and how we could follow that sort of logic. So then we produced this processing model, which was looking at how do you um, simulate um, uh, uh, virtual termites or whatever it was, that we're modeling this thing, and went through a series of iterations I won't bore you with now, which are trying to explore how these could effectively uh, model this kind of um, behavior and develop something. And so that then led to, I'll skip the, the, the stuff, to um, led to a, a kind of um, uh, a sort of uh, an architecture that, that appeared which was with these kind of uh, ventilation shafts um, that was generated through processing um, that were then uh, deployed in certain, um, tested out, and then deployed in certain sort of buildings. So this would be an atrium going up through the central building uh, that was acting like the termite um, with the, the ventilation shaft that then produced something that then, and that's the extract as it were, for, for, for that particular building. So that was a kind of building as such. Then there was a project in, in Hong Kong, which was um, looking at the, the, the former Kai Tak Airport, which is this um, kind of tabula rasa, four kilometers long, 400 meter wide, um, uh, this one that's kind of not used now that they've moved into a different um, arena. And we were looking, um, trying to think about how how we could urbanize that space. And we started looking at, at Cristalla's theory of how central place theory, and how you have um, up, uh, lower order nodes, upper order nodes, um, but in fact, you can see in some ways in a kind of like a, a map of France how that actually pans out. And then looking at a particular kind of site and, and just noticing that uh, there's a supermarket on the left hand side. What's interesting is they're already, there's an intelligence there already. They, they're all almost the same distance apart, um, 1100 something meters. So then the idea was that you could look at many other things. You could look at shopping centers, you could look at uh, um, I don't know, clinics, uh, shops, or housing things in the same kind of logic. And we tried to sort of use that as a way of. Uh, how would you then, in a sense, carpet this otherwise empty space with the existing kind of logic of that building, of, 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 of the urbanism around, 
So here you've got the red ones that are up higher over the nose and the grey ones are lower over the nose. And what they begin to kind of construct is this kind of web of points that then become the nodal points that are in a sense uh, like that. What you can see also here is, is the difficulty you have with processing in the sense that here yeah, it, 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 to, it, it that dis doesn't regard, it disregards the background at some point. And it, um, so it's difficult to control in some ways. Anyway, eventually what one can be able to do is to uh, construct this kind of framework that if you then were to populate it with the same um, urbanism as the rest of Hong Kong, should kind of camouflage it as though it was all part of the same kind of logic of, 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 um, of Hong Kong. So this was a kind of an exercise that was trying to use it in a more kind of performative way to try and locate the nodal points. And we actually then, the next step was to then, um, you have a, um, uh, you then use the processing script to then start cancelling out the ones that are not being used enough so you reduce down this. And it's interesting that some engineers use processing precisely this to try and uh, to find the, the, the lines of stress in the structure. Um, and so on. So this was, I, this was kind of interesting as an example. It then becomes, a, in fact the planners were interested in this more than anything else that we did. Um, we, then, we then looked at the typology of, of um, uh, of, of Hong Kong, and this is a study that was probably simplistic in many ways, but you could then develop a new typology and, and populate the, the space in a different sort of way, um, but it could be anything kind of thing, you know? So that was an attempt to try and, to try and do that. So we, we, there was, you, you can use it in a more kind of performative way. That's not Rawlings. You. He's a citizen the kind of aesthetic that comes out. Even though he's kind of slightly disingenuously talking about structure and structural members, which are not really structural. But, I, mean, I think there's a kind of, it's, it's capital. Many people sort of deal with this in many different sort of ways. So, uh, and I, my frustration is that it's not terribly good at this, you know, to be honest. Um, I wish it were better. Um, and that's really the kind of question that I'm, I'm, I'm faced with, you know, you know, where is the intelligence? Um, you know, I think the slime mold is about the most intelligent one that I've come across so far. And, and, and it's not surprising, therefore, that Marco Dorigo drops the word intelligence when he's talking about his swarm mode project. Because you'll notice a number of single reference to intelligence there. So it's a challenge, you know, I think, you know, well, that was the best we could do. Alguna otra pregunta? I think we are running out of steam here. Um, okay, then we we'll, we'll leave it there, and uh, thank you very much, Ian. It was a great uh, lecture. So, thank you.